some introductions. First of all, I would like to introduce Christy Case. And Christy um, started her adult life as a music teacher. That's how I know Christy. And she, she taught here at Benzie and, um, and now is spending her time full time at the Cherry Hut, except tonight. And they were overwhelmed tonight. They really did need her. So <laughs> anyway, uh, we are so happy to have Christy narrate this panel this evening. Um, Kay Holt, I don't know what I can say about Kay, except she's been around the chariot forever, way longer than you have. <laughs> Kay started in 1973 as a waitress, and she has worked her way up that now she is one of the managers. So that is, is really great to have Kay with us tonight. And I know she can answer anybody's questions. <laughs> sure, she says, yeah, right. And those of you that came to last month's Academy lecture saw this gentleman right here and you thought, oh, gee, you know, we're going to get him again. But Ned is such a good speaker and he brought his ukulele with him. I'm not real sure why, but I think we're going to find out. So um, Ned worked at the Cherry Hut and he met his wife through the Cherry Hut that summer that he worked there. And so Ned has a very long history of Cherry Jerry and Cherry Pie. I'm going to finish my introduction tonight with Chris McKinnis down here at the end. And Chris really didn't have a very long experience of working at the Cherry Hut. In fact, it was just a couple years. And I guess mid season of her second year, somebody asked her if it was her first day. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that. <laughs> I think Chris has moved on to bigger things. Anyway, Chris um, is representing the Craker family, the Craker Petritz family. She is now the matriarch of the family, and we all miss her mother, Althea, and so she is here to represent her family tonight. So you've listened to me long enough. So um, Christy, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Appreciate that introduction. As many of you know, my name is Christy Case, co-owner of the Cherry Hut, along with my husband, Andy Case, and our two sons, Carson Case and Caleb Case. Andy, unfortunately, could not be here this evening as someone needs to be at the restaurant tonight holding down the fort. And last I knew, there was a 40-minute wait tonight. <laughs> And our oldest son, Carson, is also working tonight. <laughs> My youngest, Caleb, is with me, who also does his part at the Cherry Hut. He stickers all the pie lids for us, the hundreds of pie lids. He helps me with the souvenirs, and most importantly, he taste tests the product. The Cherry Hut has only been a part of my life for the past 20 years. So I certainly do not know every fact that has contributed to the 100 years of success. I'll do my best to relay accurate information, but thankfully I have a wonderful panel alongside me this evening to contribute stories and facts that have helped make the Cherry Hut what it is today. Also helping to make this evening possible are of course, Barb Mort, the executive director, the Mills Community House, Larry White, and all the members of the Benzonia Historical Society. And certainly to the author, Claudia Breland, for taking on this book project and completing it in a remarkable amount of time. Before we begin, I've noticed that there are several cherry hutters in the audience. So I'd like to ask anyone who's worked at the Cherry Hut or currently works at the Cherry Hut to please stand and be recognized. Don't be afraid. I know you're out there. That whole row. <laughs> I 
I think any business owner knows that you can only be successful if you have a wonderful and dedicated staff. That certainly stands true for the Cherry Hut. And one last thing before we start with our panel discussion, please make sure that you grab a three ounce bag of milk chocolate cherries on your way out. And that you've also filled out a slip with your name to be entered in the drawing tonight for a free pie. I have five pies behind me that we will be handing out throughout the evening. They have been stamped with the original pie stamp that is sitting over on the table. Though we would have loved to continue this tradition, the amount of pies that we put out on a daily basis, um, it just would not be possible. And if you, you look at the pies, it doesn't necessarily make the prettiest and cheeriest cherry jerry face. So <laughs> hence the reason why we no longer do that. Throughout the lecture this evening, we'll be going through the timeline of the book from pie stand to icon, the hundred year history of the cherry hut. All of the panelists tonight contributed to the making of this book in one way, shape or form. We'll start off with the early days and a pre-recorded excerpt from Althea Craker Petritz. We were certainly saddened to hear of the passing of Althea this past June. I do know that her caregiver, Rachel Higgins, read the book in its entirety to Althea. And Andy and I are so grateful to the contributions that she made to help make this book happen, and certainly for her friendship throughout the years. She was a true ambassador of this community and of the Cherry Hut. We have to just make uh, apologize to those that are listening on Zoom tonight. You will be able to see the video, but unfortunately you will not be able to hear the video. Jane, can you turn the light down the front? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Ever since I can remember, the cherry hut was in existence as a way to um, use cherries in the table. And so they made cherry pies, and it was a little tiny shed thing, but it was cute. My mother had a, a flair for making things fun. And it had red and white striped, of all things, at that age and stage, awnings. So now I'm having a bite cherry pie. Well, they were pretty special. And, and, and I ended up running the cherry hut when I was in college. That was in high school, I worked there. There was a time when we made a hundred pies a day at the church. I mean, it was a summer resort operation. It was, it was seasonal, certainly. And so were chairs. And of course, the cherry hut became fairly well known, and it's still in existence. Through the 1940s. Thank you. Off already, sorry. They told me as the moderator I could cut people off, and <laughs> I forgot about our first pie drawing. My apologies, Ned. One second. So I need my assistant, Caleb. He's going to draw a name out of our bowl of cherries. And we're going to hand out our first pie. He did say he was going to put his name in there. I didn't think we needed any more cherry pie. All right, here we go. Our first pie winner is, I'm going to try to, is there a Wiley Schaefer? All right. Oh, whoop, whoop. 
she's coming for it. And I'm going to tell you folks, they're still a little warm. They just came out of the oven about 45 minutes ago. So, all right. Okay, Ned, now we'll give it back. Okay. Sorry about that. Hey, thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Good. Well, I want to start tonight by uh, introducing the Cherry Hut scrapbook. This is the Cherry Hut scrapbook that used to sit under the front counter for many, many years um, from the 19 mid 50s on. And uh, it is filled with all kinds of wonderful pictures. And Mary Lontrap uh, sat down with me uh, oh, five or six years ago and we went through and tried to remember everybody's name and put the names under all the pictures so people could, could remember who people were back in the 1950s. That was 70 years ago. That was a long time. But um, this now has been donated to the museum and is available at the museum. And uh, one of my cousins, Phoebe Vance, whose picture is in here, Phoebe Wolf, came into the museum just a, a couple of days ago. And Jane was telling me that this was open in a case and it was open to Phoebe's picture. And she walked in and said, that's me. And uh, yeah, it's full of, full of memories. The uh, book credits, uh, that is when I say the book, I'm talking about uh, uh, Claudia uh, Breland's wonderful book that uh, she spent so much time researching and writing and and I was with her um, almost every day back in January and February uh, as remember names and so it could be accurate and it is and it's very accurate it's a wonderful wonderful hundred year book here but anyway the um, book gives Bobby and Nancy Trapp who are sitting right here in the front row uh, credit for this book but I think there were many people who were uh, involved in it and I think they did the cover uh, because we found several covered uh, covers like this in the trap basement when we cleaned it out um, about 20 years ago and uh, so uh, we know they did that part of it but uh, it's a wonderful summary of particularly the 40s and the and the 50s. Most of the pictures you will see running on the screen behind me are from the scrapbook. And the reason there are so many photos of this era is that during World War II, no cameras or film was available. I don't know how many of you lived uh, during uh, the early 40s, during World War II. I did. And I was a, a young person then and remembered how badly I wanted a camera. And they weren't available until 1947 when Kodak put out its first brownie reflex camera. And everybody went out and bought a camera and bought film and started taking pictures like crazy because they hadn't been allowed to for, for five years. Uh, so that's why we have so many pictures of, of the 40s and 50s and I'm glad we do. But the 40s were the war years and World War II ended the summer of 1945. And then came the recovery years of 45 to 50, when gas rationing and sugar rationing ended and people started traveling and vacation uh, was something we could talk about again because we could buy the tires and the, and the gasoline to go somewhere. And um, Remember that smoking cigarettes had been promoted to all the troops during World War II. So that was a big thing in the 50s. Everybody was smoking. And so little baby boomers were running all over the Cherry Hut lawn. And smoking cigarettes meant that everybody put their cigarette out on the lawn with their foot. So it was the um, uh, 
joyous job of, of those two of us who worked there during those years to go out and goop the yard. Remember that term, gooping the yard, which means you had to go out after every customer and pick up hundreds of cigarette butts and other unmentionable things that children would spill or poop on the grass. So there was always fun uh, keeping the grass clean. The Cherry Hope was still owned and operated by the Craker family um, during this period. And Althea Craker managed it during the war years. In 1946, she married a war hero, George Petritz, which is uh, Fritz's father. Um, George had escaped a Japanese prison ship in the, in the Pacific as a naval commander and uh, uh, had survived. And she, and uh, that is Althea, and George got married and moved to Benzie County. And because frozen foods was the big rage after World War II, everybody had a freezer for the first time on their refrigerator. And so you could, you know, get green giant frozen peas. And uh, George Petrit said, well, why shouldn't they get a frozen cherry pie? And he and uh, Althea, spent a long time experimenting with making frozen pies and they started the Petrits food company the pet is what is now St. Philip's Episcopal Church and when my office was in uh, St. Philip's Episcopal Church there was a little sign over the light switches out in the hall and it said pie factory lights. So when you turn on those lights, you knew where the pie factory originally was. And um, then the second pie factory uh, was what is now the auto parts store next door to the Cherry Hut, just north of the Cherry Hut. And it had a freezer and a cooler where frozen pies were stored for shipment and use at the Cherry Hut. In 1950, every pie baked at the Cherry Hut had been frozen uh, next door. And so it was uh, my job to go next door, pick up the rim over the oven, and uh, just figured out a way to these so they came out just perfectly it was a, a wonderful thing but I always had to take one of the waitresses one of the girls along to carry the pies because um, it took more than I could carry and in the cooler before you hung the carcasses of animals like hogs and uh, uh, and To sort of cringe and try not to look as they went by the dead bodies of these animals. I tried to make it nicer for them by naming them. And, and um, I'd say, oh, the, you know, this is Uncle Joe and, and this is Uncle George. And, uh, and the, the girl liked that. There's a story in, in this book that uh, I think it's on page 36. Um, that is about the day it rained because everybody ate outdoors. When it rained, there were often no customers. And that was one of those afternoons where we said, what do we do? Well, the whole staff was there, except George and Althea who owned the place. And so I said, well, let's have a, let's have a funeral for those uh, hogs and sheep over in the in the cooler and so we went out and picked flowers and we did all sorts of fun things and i had my ukulele and we uh went singing and over to the to the cooler and uh i said some words of committal and then we all recessed back and on the way back we noticed that george and althea were standing watching us and wondering why nobody was manning the cherry hut uh I think that was one of the times I got fired, but it was, 
it was always an interesting and joyful thing to work there. Yeah, George hired me at the tender age of 16 and uh, told me that I was to take the Montgomery Ward catalog and order by COD, cash on delivery, my cook's uniform. So I went over to the post office and, and uh, put in this order. Uh, but I had noticed over that, that there were a lot of other nice things in that catalog that I'd like to have. And, and one was this gorgeous ukulele. And uh, so I added that to the order with my uniform and all that. And I remember when it came, uh, uh, George said, well, I'll, I'll pay for it. Uh, you're earning cents an hour. I'm taking 25 cents uh, uh, out of every hour that ukulele is paid for which, as I recall, took about a month. But uh, the interesting thing um, about all that, that fun time we had uh, was that with only 25 cents an hour left, I got pretty hungry. And um, so I thought I, policy was any staff member could eat as much as they want. I thought that was a great policy, uh, but it turned out not to be a good policy. So thought uh, the owners, because all the food was disappearing because I was eating it. And uh, that uh, didn't last very long. Soon I was paying for everything I ate. But you know, the menu at the Cherry Hut had been about the same for about 20 years into the 50s. They were freshly cooked turkey sandwiches, ham and cheese sandwiches, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, vegetable soup, uh, beverages, pie a la mode. And this afternoon I decided I would take the 1947 menu that appears in this book on page uh, 28, 1947 menu. Um, I think that was the first year, Mary Lon, that you were the manager uh, at the Cherry Hut. And I stopped by and, and got from Neil uh, uh, a today's menu. I highlighted and underlined everything on today's menu that was also on the 1947 menu. And you can see how much is there. Uh, almost all of the original menu is still on the menu, even though it's been expanded quite a bit. And to me, that is why the, uh, the Cherry Hut is still so popular. You know, it is probably the only restaurant, seasonal restaurant in all of Michigan that is successful without a liquor license. Do you ever think about that? And Andy uh, Case told me, he said, when I went to restaurant school down in Michigan State, they said, get a liquor license. The only way you can survive. Not true with the cherry, because they're still, I mean, where else can you go in the state of Michigan and get a full fresh baked turkey dinner for such a reasonable cost. Here, um, you know, the, the sliced turkey sandwich, which was fresh back in 1947, was 50 cents. Today, it is right. The original sliced turkey, it's now 8.50. A uh, little bit of inflation there. But, um, you know, back in the 1940s and 50s, this was a, a real treat to be able to eat and eat good food and fresh food and freshly cooked food. And of course, the jam kitchen. The jam kitchen was a big deal because nobody else made jam back in those days that was fresh and from local cherries. And, um, 
One of the other things I, I did was stop by the Cherry Hut today and pick up some, I uh, already ate half of this one, but I picked up the top three sellers. And these were the top three back in the 50s. These were the ones that were cased together and called the Cherry Hut three. And do you know what they were? Well, I think Mary Lyons got it. This is the jelly. This is the sweet cherry conserve, which I had for dinner tonight. And pure cherry preserves. And I asked Andy, I said, what's the difference between pure cherry preserves and cherry jam? You know the difference? I'm sure you do. The difference is that pure cherry preserves have whole cherries in them. And cherry jam has sliced cherries or chopped cherries, chopped cherries. Um, and pure cherry preserves is still the big seller. Just amazing that that's okay. And I asked, uh, uh, Christy denied it. I said, whatever happened to dead pies? <laughs> dead pies. And she said, you mean the pies that were baked yesterday? And I said, yes, that's exactly what they were. Any unsold baked pie of the previous day was pronounced dead in the 1950s and could not be sold. I uh, survived that summer and uh, paid for my ukulele by eating dead pies. Every morning, I would have a dead pie for breakfast with milk and sugar, and I would eat it just like cereal. I'd pour the milk on the pie, I'd get a spoon and stir it up and, and put some sugar on it, maybe a little cinnamon, and uh, uh, it was not good for my teenage acne, but it was uh, delicious. Uh, but the big highlight of the 50s really was, was Mary Lawn Traps our manager for four years, being chosen as the National Cherry Queen at the Cherry Festival in Traverse City in 1951. That was a real highlight. <laughs> Mary Lynn, why don't you, you stand up so they can see how beautiful you still are. Yeah. <laughs> Mary Lynn, uh, just, just announced uh, that she this year is 90 years old. But I think uh, I think she could still win the uh, Cherry Queen title. Uh, and that was a wonderful thing for, for the Cherry Hut. You know, it made the Cherry Hut famous all over the country. And uh, everybody talked about the manager of the Cherry Hut is the Cherry Queen. And uh, that, that was special. So I'll conclude this story about me, uh, conclude this talk with about, uh, about uh, the Terry Hut in the 50s. It's a story about me and Mary Lawn, one of the many stories that were not included in the book. I've talked to a number of former employees. They said, well, I didn't get my story in either. I said, tell me your story. I said, I understand why it's not in the book. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, my job every night was to lock up after cleaning the ovens. And on several occasions, I inadvertently put, took the keys uh, and instead of putting them under the doormat where Mary Lawn could find them the next morning, I put them in my pocket and took them home without realizing it. And when Mary Lawn came the next morning and tried to open up the hut, there were no keys. So she would have to drive the three miles out to my little cabin on Crystal Lake where I was living all by myself and wake me up by shouting, where are the keys, Ned? And I would suddenly wake up, which would be about eight o'clock in the morning. I hadn't gone to bed, you know, till midnight. Uh, wake up. 
this amazingly beautiful cherry queen. And it was too much for a 16 year old teenage boy. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And that's what gave rise to the song Ode to Cherry Jerry, or as it is named in the scrapbook, The Cherry Hut in the Sky. And um, I'm going to conclude just by singing that song for you. That's me. That picture was taken 72 years ago uh, next month at the concluding party during the 40s and 50s. The cherry had always closed on Labor Day weekend. And, uh, and this was uh, the night before Labor Day. And uh, we had a party and uh, I played my ukulele and sang. You know, in those days after World War uh, II, baseball caps, not till the 60s and 70s. So um, that's why I am addressed in my uniform there with a sailor's cap. Okay, here's the song. Cherry pie is in my tummy. Jam is in my mouth. For Cherry Jerry has called me northward from my winter in the south. And I know when I'm in heaven Cherry Jerry will beckon me to the cherry hut eternal where the pie is always free. Thank you, Ned, for letting us know a little bit about the 40s and 50s and what really went on at the Cherry Hut. I'm surprised you were only fired twice. Ah, just kidding. <laughs> and I can attest to gooping the yard because that still exists. Now it's gooping the parking lot. And I have to say, I've done it once. Yeah, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. <laughs> All right, we have another pie drawing. So if Caleb, you can come up and draw another name out of the bowl of cherries for me. You can leave it on the piano too. You just leave it right there. All right. Liz Richard. Liz. All right. Perfect. Enjoy. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move into the 1960s and I'm gonna hand the mic over to Chris McGinnis. Thank you so much, Christy. And before I go back with a couple of recoll recollections, I just wanna thank Christy and Andy and Ned as well, but particularly Christy and Andy Case for really very generous, generously, and I would say very accurately Recognizing the role of the Crakers and Petritzes in the history of the Cherry Hut. I cannot tell you how much that means to all of us. George, I'm expecting you to, to uh, agree. We, we really do want to congratulate you on you know, achieving 100 years, bringing the Cherry Hut to the 100 year mark because that, that's a huge accomplishment and we're uh, very grateful and excited. I also, very much want to thank the Benzie Area Historical Society and Larry White for documenting Althea's story. Um, you heard just a, a, a piece of it in her words and in her voice, that soft voice, but it was really clear. And I think whenever we hear that voice, we also hear the fun that, that comes through it, comes, com comes through it. Um, we cherish that this history is documented 
that it's preserved uh, for generations to come. And the last thing I just want to say, and kind of touching on my mom and thinking about it, because you can't listen to this without thinking about Althea. Um, but having this uh, oral history, it's really precious, I think, to me, and I'm sure everyone in our family. Because rather than having to rely on those conversations with your mom that roll around in your head and kind of imagine it, um, that tell her story in her words and what was important to her. All I have to do is just click a link and it kind of connects me with my North Star. So Larry, Carol, and the Benzie Area Historical Society, again, thank you so much for that piece. Um, so as, as Jane shared, which I shared with her, that I by no means was one of the distinguished Cherry Jerry helpers. I got through it and it was a, um, I got through it. And it was in the uh, 60, 1966, 1965 and 66, all right? But I thought I might share a couple of facts, you know, filling in a little bit of the background. And the first thing, Ned mentioned the original pie factory, which of course is today St. Philip's Church. But just adding on to that, and I don't know if anyone here remembers what the original pie factory was constructed of. Ned, do you remember? You did, do you know? It was a Quonset hut because that's the only material that was available. So there you go. And that would have been 46, 47. Another story, and this is before my working as a Cherry Jerry helper, was in 1955. This was when um, George and Althea sold Pet Ritz Foods to Pet Mel. And I, I know many of you here recall George and recall that he was pretty slow in his speech, but he knew what the heck he was doing. Well, as you might imagine that negotiation with Ted Gamble, who was the president of Pet Mel, it went on and on and on. And I think it went on until one or two o'clock in the morning. And I think by then they kind of reached a deal. <laughs> I remember my dad telling me later that the next morning, Ted Gamble asked him, did I buy the cherry hut also? And of course, of course he didn't. At that point, George and Althea uh, still retained the cherry hut and then sold it to Leonard 1959. Thank you very much. Um, so my, you know, I, I promised that I would share an, probably an example of why I kind of, I didn't get fired, but it was damn close. <laughs> Instead, I got split shifts for the rest of the summer, which means I worked breakfast, serving the Beulah breakfast bountiful. I was out of there by 11, 11.30. And then I think, or maybe, yeah. And then I had to come back um, and probably start working about five. It was a terrible shift. Nobody wanted it. But here's how I, here's how I earned it. You know, Ned, Ned mentioned about, you know, the, uh, the, the funeral, the funeral ceremony. But this was, it wasn't raining this particular day. But it was, I think it was one of those mornings we did not really have enough to do. And of course, we didn't really think, because of course I worked there for Leonard. We didn't really think Leonard was around. You know, this is when, <laughs> uh, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And, and I think it was Dave Van Hammond and somebody else. It was, okay, well, I, and again, I asked Dad to confirm on this, but you know, those the cherries came in these frozen, pails, right? The metal frozen pails. And at this point, they primarily came from cherry growers. And I think they were 30 pounds. Well, after they had gone in, you know, become the pie filling, um, they were empty. And one of the things that you could kind of do is you could stand at the back stoop going out. Kay is laughing. She might have it. 
you know, yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, that was kind of the game. You went out the back and, you know, that's where you were eating the dead pies and all sorts of stuff happening. You weren't smoking, but it was dead pies um, and maybe some ice cream. But somebody would pour water on you as you went out. Okay, well, I think that had been close to me. I almost got wet, but I wasn't totally wet. But I kind of wanted to get even with the person that would be coming out the door. And I, again, I'm gonna blame it on Dave. So I was at the back door, <laughs> a pail full of water, and I dumped it on Leonard. Now, Leonard also would appear lots of times to be fairly slow, right? I mean, not so much. Leonard took off after me. We are racing around. And realistically, Leonard was not happy. I mean, <laughs> he, he failed just as Althea didn't capture all the humor in the funeral for Uncle Joe. Leonard didn't really find this to be overly hysterical either. So, but, but I think we were towards the end of summer. Um, and again, I went to split shifts. Um, so uh, one other story, and I don't think this was so much in the 60s that I will share, but I suspect some of you that worked in the 50s um, remember when a storm would come, right? And the sign, does everybody remember the sign swinging? And I can remember my dad or whomever was slightly in charge being pretty frantic. And the job was to get the cars that were parked, Mary Lon is, you, you, get the cars that were parked near the sign to move them in case the sign fell down. So that, that, that was one of the, you know, one of the things that, again, you get the umbrellas down, but you also made sure that the sign, the cars that were under the sign moved. So that was it. Um, and I would say that, of course, in the 60s, gooping, gooping was still part of it. Leonard's statement that we were all kind of raised with was time to lean, time to clean. Right, Christy? And Caleb, I'm sure you've uh, heard that as well. So with, with that, I'm going to say, again, thank you so much. Uh, this means a, a, a lot. And I'm going to turn it, I'm going to turn it over to Kay, but first, Kay is pointing out that we have another pie draw. Caleb, bring it on. Ellen Hersher. Ellen. That is Chris and her mom, Althea, standing together. <laughs> Kay Holt, she's going to speak on the 1970s and 80s. Thank you, Christy. Um, as, a, as a teacher also, I can't teach or talk sitting down. <laughs> 40 years of being at the top of the class and everything else, so I'm going to have to do that tonight. Um, I think for me, if I, if I were to look at my biggest memories of the Cherry Hut, it will start with hijinks. <laughs> that seems to be a common theme that goes on here. Not so much today, I will tell you that. But um, last night I came home from work, so this is very appropriate that you had talked about yours. And one of my neighbors was out in there walking her dog. And I did not realize that she was the mother of a fellow coworker of mine. And she says, oh, what was your maiden name? And I said, Kay Drexel. She says, oh, I know all about you. <laughs> and I'm, oh. <laughs> 
apparently her, her daughters with whom I worked, um, they used to come home and she would hear them whispering, just tell mom what you think she wants to hear and nothing else. So we had quite a few Van Hammonds again, only the, the younger ones, Rick and, and Tom and Steve, we would go over to the bunkhouse after work. So that was kind of a fun time for us too. I don't think they do that so much anymore. Flat River trips seem to be the norm nowadays out in public rather than the outlet at night. Um, for me, I think what the Case family brought to what was already an icon, what was already an established restaurant was the destination part of it. It, it turned from being a restaurant and jam and jelly and wonderful food and wonderful pie into this, this destination of everything. And that pretty much started when Leonard married Brenda, June 10th, 1972. I know that date because oddly enough, my husband's birthday, not 1972, but my husband's birthday is June 10th. And that's their anniversary. Our anniversary is June 13th, and that was Leonard's birthday. So kind of a freaky coincidence. So, but um, you know, that's just one of those things about life that happens sometimes. And when Leonard met Brenda, she had this let's go one more step. It started, and I will confess this is me. When I do server training, I always tell this story, so I will share it with you, even though it is highly embarrassing for me. We didn't do a lot of server training when I started. There was pretty much, here's the menu, look at it. Now go take an order, because it's not hard to do. Go take an order. The first order I had was turkey dinners. I had looked at the menu. What I didn't realize was I had eight questions I needed to ask. I just said, I've got turkey dinners. I came back in, and the cook said, what kind of potatoes do they want? I'll go ask. I go back and ask, what kind of potatoes would you like? I come back with the kind of potatoes that they would like. And what's their salad dressing? I'll go ask. This, and nobody thought to tell me, and don't forget to also ask for this, and don't forget to also ask for this, and also ask for this. So I made like eight trips. And Brenda's watching this, and this is, I'm in 73, so she has been married to Leonard for one year. And that was when Brenda started her red three ring binder which was about server training, all because I was an idiot. There, there is no other word for it. And we still actually, when Brenda was no longer able to do the server training herself and she asked me to take it over, she gave me her red binder. And I went through it and I just took everything out of it that she had said and condensed it down into what we call Cherry Jerry's Helpful Handbook. Cherry Jerry's Helpful Handbook. What was it called? Cherry, Cherry Jerry's Handbook of Helpful Hints uh, for being a server at the Cherry Hut. And we use that now, and it's all pure Brenda. That was one of the things that she absolutely brought was this. She was also a teacher, and she felt that we needed to be taught better what to do so that we were putting this persona in front of the public that people would say, this place has class. And these people know what they're doing. And the second thing that Brenda brought was trinkets and treasures. We had some trinkets. We had this cute little, uh, I don't know what to puzzle, I guess. It had these little beads in it and a cherry jerry face. And if you were really good, you could put the beads into the face. I never could. Uh, we had a little puzzle, one of those where you slide the things. It's a square about that big and you slide and it would make a cherry jerry face. We had some cards and things like that, but Brenda said, we're going to sell souvenirs. We're going to sell socks. We're going to sell towels. We're going to sell X, Y, and Z. And Leonard is, what? We're not doing that junk. So Brenda goes ahead and she gets all these things together. And one day Leonard has his jams and every jam or jelly jar has a specific place it had to go in, in, you know, <laughs> in the restaurant and the specific place for that jar. And Brenda comes out and she's looking at the space he's allotted to her, which is about that much space. So she moves some of his product and she spends about a half an hour setting out all this beautiful stuff. She has beautiful items that she has chosen. And Leonard walks out and says, 
what's this? Takes his arm and goes whoosh back to that much space. So this beautiful display is this mess, this, this mess of stuff. And he then sets all of his jars back out right where they were before. And I won't tell you what happened next. <laughs> but they did leave the area where all the rest of us were avidly watching. <laughs> And, and Brenda did have a space for her souvenirs the next day. So um, that is one of my favorite memories of, of the Cherry Hut because I actually witnessed that. And, and um, is there a theme of almost get fired here? <laughs> because because I did something one time and Brenda says, do you know what happens to people who sass their employers? And I sassed her right back and said, yes, they get canned. She said, watch it. <laughs> Fortunately, she did not. And she became one of my dearest friends. Leonard also um, have so many great, wonderful memories, personal memories of them and working with them. But I think there's someone else that I met when I first came to the Cherry Hut that needs the mention, and that's Nye Hawkins. For those of you who knew Nye, he, he was that proverbial jack of all trades. Now the proverb says master of none, but that's not Nye. He was the master of all the trades as well. It did not matter what was going wrong at the cherry hut and I could fix it. it. It didn't make any difference. I'd see Leonard and Nye out and they'd be working on an umbrella and it'd just fall one down and all of a sudden it's fixed. There's a plumbing issue and all of a sudden it's fixed. And you know, Nye was the person who could take care of that. And that was, he taught me and a lot of us who worked there, the value of working for what you want and doing the best job that you can do whenever it is you have a job to do. And that's something that I have taken with me my entire life because I was an impressionable 16 year old when I started there. And to have people who were my bosses, who were successful people because they worked hard. Leonard worked hard. He was at the restaurant we opened, we were from 10 to 10. And he was there long before the restaurant opened and he was there long after the restaurant closed every night doing the books and doing all those kinds of things. And I don't know this for a fact, but I will bet he learned that from your mother and, and father because you learn what other people ahead of you are doing and, and that's... <laughs> yes, Leonard was, Leonard was so particular. He not only wrote down, he wrote down every piece of food that was sold every single day, what the weather was like on that day. He has a book that has all these statistics in it. And we still keep a lot of those statistics today because they help us to be successful with that. Um, the other thing that, that they did was they understood modernization. In the 60s, that's when we started getting cool stuff like air conditioning, no pun intended. Um, but we started getting things like that. And Leonard realized we needed to have a building that would have air conditioning in it. And so he caused what we call the old, because it was when we built the new in 1980, it was the old dining room and the new was the new dining room. And being the fact that we can't change any names, they're still called the old and the new. And the super, if you ever hear anybody talk about you're sitting in the super, that was because in 2004, it was super new. We have these clever names for these things. Um, but he realized that we needed this and that outdoor dining was still popular, but it wasn't going to be the future. And Leonard, I think that was one of the things that Leonard did and that Andy and Christy have continued to do is move the restaurant to being what it is what the world is today and what the world wants today and knowing what, what people need and want and, um, and yet not letting go of what's the lesson from the past. For those of you who have been into the Cherry Hut this year, seeing the recreation of the original Cherry Hut pie stand inside where we are selling pies once again. And that I think is what makes Cherry Hut what it is, is the fact that although the owners have continued to move forward. They have never lost sight of where they began and what it takes to be successful. And that's why it's a hundred years and it'll still be around in a hundred years if you keep it up. Thank you very much and another pie drawing. Thank you, Kay. 
All right, we have another pie drawing, Caleb. Laura Shapiro. Oh, well, how about that? Right next to each other. Well, I know you've been sitting for a little while, so I'll, I'll try to keep it moving along. I am the last speaker this evening. I'm very humbled by the, the panelists. Thank you for your words tonight. I'd like to, during my segment here, to just touch on some things that I think people would be interested to know that maybe you don't know. We've talked about the history and various experiences. So I'm going to talk about my family's experience and what it means to us. My experience in the last 20 years as part of the Cherry Hut family has taught me many things. The first and most important is that owning your own business is a lot of work. I think I always considered myself someone who had a pretty solid work ethic. I truly didn't understand what real hard work was until I was fully immersed in the daily operations at the hut. I witnessed it firsthand through my husband and through my father and mother-in-law and my sister-in-law who worked there until she graduated from college and then moved on to North Carolina. With my mother-in-law, Brenda, it was through her meticulous training that she provided each new server and my father-in-law's attention to detail and record keeping. And he does have a lot of Leonardisms, we call them. Um, his, another one of his favorite sayings, besides, if you can lean, you can clean. This is my other favorite. One person gets all the work done, two people get some of the work done, and three people get nothing done. That one always makes me chuckle. Another level of their dedication was that Brenda and Leonard used to have the Cherry Hut phone line ring at their home while the Cherry Hut was open. And the first thing I told Andy was that's a real definite no for me. Please do not. It would be ringing nonstop. And a lot of times Leonard would answer the phone as well as the person at the Cherry Hut and listen to the conversation to make sure that everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing while he was gone. Sometimes he would speak also. My father-in-law spent about all day every day at the restaurant. And when he wasn't at the restaurant, he and Andy were at the jam kitchen or products building, hand pouring thousands of jars of jam. I think some might have thought of Leonard as a bit abrasive, but he was a brilliant businessman and cared a lot about his community and his family. I think my favorite story about him in the book was recollected by Neil Marshall. So I'm going to read that to you. It's a very short one. Leonard was a disciplined record keeper. He also enjoyed a good dip in Crystal Lake on a beautiful summer day. Occasionally, these two impulses conflicted. One hot August afternoon, a customer approached the young lady manning the cash register and angrily demanded to speak to the manager. Of course, the cashier replied. Can I inform him what the problem is? There is a man sitting at a table on the patio wearing a wet bathing suit and a bathrobe, the customer fumed. The cashier leaned forward to glance out the door toward the patio. Oh, that is the manager, ma'am. Leonard had apparently interrupted his swim to log his three o'clock sales. That was very much my father-in-law. <laughs> my day at the, at the Cherry Hut typically begins between 6 and 7 a.m. and can sometimes go until the last pan is washed in the kitchen around 8.30 p.m. or later. Once I make it home for the evening, I open up my computer to answer all the Cherry Jerry emails. So if you've ever received an email from Cherry Jerry, that's usually me. On a good day, I get a bit of a break in the afternoon or sometimes a night off. So thank you to the Historical Society for tonight because this is like a vacation for me. Thank you, I appreciate it. For Andy, it begins around 9.30 a.m. and goes until about 10.30 p.m. when all the workers are gone, the paperwork is finished, and the walkthrough of the entire restaurant is complete. Most importantly, making sure that all the coolers and refrigeration are working properly and that the turkey ovens are turned on. 
he has saved many a turkey during his nightly walkthrough. Our baker begins her day at 2.30 a.m. and typically finishes sometime between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m., depending on how much she has to bake that day. Our pie bakers, which is typically just two people, are making from scratch 300 to 350 pies a shift, and we are selling them at a rate of about 250 or more a day. Our record day was about 640 pies. We currently have 54 employees between the ages of 10, which is my son, of course, and 88. We have an 88-year-old that works in the kitchen. Our kitchen manager, Rick Van Hammen, is in his 51st year, and many other employees have worked 20-plus years or more. What makes the business so challenging is that we're not only a full-service restaurant, but also have an online ordering presence for all our jams and jellies, cherry products, souvenirs, and we have a bakery and retail store as well as several wholesale accounts. During the off season, so to speak, our products building in Benzonia opens up and we have a small gift shop and do a significant amount of shipping orders for the holiday season. We do ship pies in November and December. Why not all year? Because shipping pie is extremely expensive and very labor intensive. It takes a lot of special packaging, especially the cherry hut pies because they are juicy and they, they fall apart and melts in your mouth. So it is kind of tricky to ship that pie, but we do do it in November and December. Some interesting facts. Last season, we baked and broke down 6,500 turkeys, sold about 30,000 pies and 33,000 cinnamon rolls. Mind you, we have one person working in our bakery, Cheryl Andrews, and she made all 33,000. She has not missed a shift. In the past couple of months, we've done several interviews. And the one question that seems to be constant is, what makes the Cherry Hut so unique? And what keeps customers coming back from year to year? The Cherry Hut has been able to thrive and survive for 100 years because of the consistency of product, service, and hard work. It takes a lot of hard work to run a business, let alone a full service restaurant with a gift shop and online shipping. It's also the small touches, the continuous updates of menu items, the cleanliness and updates in the restaurant, fresh flowers in the restrooms, custom placemats and serving wear, and a 1922 hut in our main dining room. It shows that we value what we do and we value our guests' experience. We also value the importance of family and tradition. We try to make our guests feel important as well as our employees. I'm always telling the staff, in particular the kitchen staff where I work, that I wouldn't ask you to do anything that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. That includes picking up cigarettes in the parking lot. <laughs> we try to build a team atmosphere in the back of the house as well as the front of the house and my husband and I along with both of our sons are in there doing the work right along with the staff we're always trying to put out the best product possible and do whatever needs to be done to make that happen we are very service focused individuals aren't just paying for food they're paying for the service that goes along with it and as I was preparing for this evening, I noticed in, um, in Andy's office that he had this customer review that he's kept and it's been pinned on his board. And so I'm just gonna read this, this review. This was really a tough critic. So I can see why he saved it. Title, The Cherry Hut. Reviewer, Carson Case. I believe he was in second grade. Do you like good food and good service? In that case, you are going to love the Cherry Hut. I recommend you get the Carson Special. If you're lucky enough to meet me there, I can show you the grand tour. The waiters always greet you with a smile. They have a special kids menu with a lot of fun activities on it and great food. They never make a mistake, never, never, and always give you what you order. I give the Cherry Hut a five out of five stars. It is awesome. You need to go there right now.
def definitely our toughest critic. Whew. I can see why we saved that one. So that brings me to the book and our 100 year anniversary. We really wanted to do a few special things in honor of the 100th. We'd been discussing a book possibility for a few years and the only quandary was who was going to write this book and thus began the relationship with Claudia Breland. Claudia could not be here with us this evening, but I believe she is watching on live stream tonight. So I am going to read a recent blog post on her behalf. It's called No Such Thing as a Coincidence. In April of 2021, as I was sitting in my car dealership waiting for my oil change, I got a text from my cousin Dee in Beulah, Michigan. Her husband, Bob, had died in March, and she was letting me know that there would be a short graveside service on Saturday, May 15th. Up until then, I had no plans to travel because of the pandemic, but just out of curiosity, I looked up plane fares to Traverse City and found a round trip ticket for $275. That was too good to pass up, so I booked a flight and landed in Traverse City on May 13th for a week's stay in Beulah. I had more than one reason to travel to Beulah. First of all, I was writing the history of a family that wasn't mine, the Case family, whose earliest settler in Benzie County, Lucius W. Case, arrived in 1860. And second of all, I had managed to contact the current owner of the house in Bear Lake that was built by my great-grandfather, great Henry Hickox Chase, and she had offered to give me a tour. I had my research agenda well planned, and in turn, sometimes more than once, I visited the Benzonia Congregational Church, where I was able to view the original church register from 1860, the Benzie County Historical Museum, which had lots of original documents and primary information about the Case family, and the Benzie County Courthouse, where I made notes of several vital records. On my last day there, just before I left for Traverse City and my flight home, I met with Andy Case the great, great, great grandson of Lucius W. Case, an owner of the Cherry Hut, a well-loved local restaurant famous for its cherry pies. As we, both, as we both sort of expected, Andy didn't have a whole lot to add to what I already knew about the Case family. I had brought along my latest book, A Family History, written for a client with North Carolina roots, and explained that this was the kind of family history I was envisioning. He looked through it thoughtfully, set it down and said, you know, the cherry hut is turning 100 years old next year. And we thought of doing some sort of commemorative album or something. Before he could finish his sentence, my hand shot up and I said, I'll write it. I went on to explain why I was the perfect choice. I had deep roots in the area. I knew all the repositories and what they held and had been doing research as a genealogist and librarian since 1974. We came to an informal agree agreement and I flew home. The Cherry Hut was about to open for its 99th season, which as always was very busy. So it was actually not until November that Andy and I came to a firm agreement. Since neither he nor his staff had time to scan anything from their archives, they packed up the whole thing and shipped it to me in a box that must have weighed at least 40 pounds. In the meantime, I had been busy researching online. The Benzie Shores District Library has scanned and digitized Benzie County newspapers dating as far back as 1888. I had a blast looking up articles about the Cherry Hut and its original owners, James and Dorothy Craker, who began the restaurant as a simple roadside stand in 1922. After the newspapers, my next target was land records. The first question in my mind was, who did the Crakers buy the land from, and how did they come to have so many cherry trees? My next stop was Family Search, which I already knew had a good collection of records for Benzie County. According to their catalog, they only had deeds up to 1894, but they had digitized indexes up to 1923, which was all I needed. I began looking at the grantee buyer index for 1920 to 1923 for the name Craker to see when and from whom they bought their land on the North shore of Crystal Lake. Mind blown. On April 11th, 1921, James and Dorothy Craker bought their land from my great grandfather, Percy A. Reed. According to this entry, the deed was recorded on page 117 of volume 50, which of course had not been microfilmed or digitized by family search. So I called on one of my many contacts in Beulah who obligingly went to the courthouse, scanned the image and sent it to me. Then I remembered that Percy Reed 
had written an autobiography, which was typed up by my cousin D. I remember D telling me about Grandpa Percy's farm on the North Shore, and I thought perhaps he had written about it. Sure enough. These are the words of her grandfather. On April 1st, 1911, we moved a few household goods over to our farm home and commenced operations. The boys, Maurice and Orville, took hold and we set out several hundred cherry trees and also apple, peaches, a few pears and plums, also raised a fair crop of corn and oats. One year we had quite a field of potatoes, but most of our work was on the fruit. I was hardly nice. I was hardly nicely settled on the farm when I had an offer from the Judge, Judson Grocer Company to take over a stock of goods on a trust mortgage and close it out. They offered me $25 a week and expenses, and at that time, that was good wages. This was an amazing find. Not only did the Crakers buy the land from Percy Reed, but his son Maurice, Maurice is her grandfather, I apologize, helped plant the cherry trees. Over the next several months, my work life was concentrating on writing the book. And with the help of numerous people, it was published at the end of May. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> I'd like to end by just thanking you very much for being a part of the lecture this evening. My family and I are very grateful for this community the Benzonia Historical Society, and the panel members that have made this evening possible. I'd like to end with a special quote from one of our long-term customers that is included in the book. Our first stop at the lake after our seven hour drive from Ohio is for late lunch or early dinner at the Cherry Hut. And one of eventually several pies leaves with us along with Owen's newest Cherry Hut t-shirt. I can't tell you how much joy it brings me when I see him wearing one when we get back home. I know that we have passed our love of the region on to him. It's so important to have tradition and consistency in uncertain times. Sorry, I have a hard time with this quote. <laughs> it's not hard time. I will always be grateful to the Cherry Hut being an unchanging icon of the region where my family can walk in and always feel like we are at home. We thank you all for being here this evening and for recognizing our efforts throughout the years to bring good service, food, and memories to so many. We feel truly blessed to be a part of Northern Michigan. Many times we're asked, who is Cherry Jerry? I think our cashier Perry has been asked on numerous occasions if he was Cherry Jerry, to which I reply, no, he is Cherry Perry. <laughs> My husband has the best response to this question. Cherry Jerry is a little bit of all of us from pie bakers to dishwashers, cashiers, kitchen staff, and servers. All of us have a little bit of Cherry Jerry in us, the smiling pie-faced icon. Here's to another 100 years of Cherry Jerry. Thank you.